When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. This morning we are going to be discussing a topic on studying called studying the Bible, looking at how to keep it in its own context. Now, for those of you who happen to have been at the conference and heard my talk, this was kind of something I briefly touched on back then in April and uh, didn't go into much depth of explanation there, so I wanted to kind of revisit it and look at it a little more in depth about what it means to keep the Bible in its own context. Now, I want to start this by quoting from one of the points that I had initially quoted in my lecture just to bring everybody up to where we were. It says, just as with every text there is a context, so with every context there is a worldview. Actually, in any context, there are several worldviews, the prophets, the hearers, and the one progressively unveiled through revelation to which the first two must conform. Much of the labor of Bible study for the late 20th century believer is the reconstruction of those worldviews in order that the revelation may be more fully understood. Unfortunately for today, however, the reconstruction of the prophet's worldview is replaced by the imposition of the modern reader's worldview. So as Bible readers today, Our job, if we are to fully understand the writer's intent, is to keep our reading within its context. Now, this idea is not a novel one. It's not something that most of you have probably never heard uh, because it gets emphasized often here and uh, hopefully elsewhere. However, the usual emphasis on this topic tends to stop too soon in its application. If If people have any application of this aspect at all, the average reader tends to stop at the opening phrase. They tend to acknowledge that every, within every text there is a context. That is where we're going to start today, and then we want to move into the importance of the rest of this quote. So, what are the various types of context we mean when we say that the Bible must be interpreted within its own context? Most would understand already that what it means is that we should not take a part of a verse or even a whole single verse and remove it from its surrounding context and make it into something it was never intended to be. As a quote says, the individual verse has a context, meaning it must be read and understood within the verses that precede as well as follow it. The idea of context then grows out from there. A verse is best understood within the full paragraph where it exists, but also within the paragraphs that surround the paragraph where it exists, as well as the chapter where these paragraphs all exist, even out to the entire book where the chapters and the paragraphs exist. Because as we know, the writers didn't write in chapters originally. It is not uncommon for people to teach the meaning of a whole chapter of of a scripture book, yet get it wrong because they fail to understand that chapter's arguments in light of the entire argument of the book wherein it appears or to twist a chapter to where it contradicts something taught elsewhere in the same book. Another context is considered to consider is the context of a book in light of the other books or writings that are identified as being by that same author. There is much that can be learned from how such and such an author uses this or that phrase or terminology, and that must be taken into account when understanding the context of words and phrases within the writing. We can start small and look at things on a word level. How was it used by the author in that chapter, or the whole book, or other books that they have written? How were those words used originally in connection with other words within the original language that produced them? Just like people writing today, biblical writers have specific ways that they may use a word. While the word may indeed have many possible definitions, oftentimes a single author may be fond of using it with a similar meaning throughout multiple writings that they produce. This brings up the point of looking at things on a single word meaning level. This was something I'd also briefly mentioned in the conference lecture regarding people who would define a word and then use that meaning in a literal wooden manner throughout everywhere in Scripture that they find that word, regardless of who said it or where it's found or what type of literature it's used. They often may ignore the fact that it is it has many definitions depending on how it is being used. And this kind of wooden interpretive approach leads to all kinds of problems. Again, context plays a huge part 
in getting to the root of how a single word or phrase is being used. You cannot simply grab a tool like Strong's, look up the Greek or Hebrew word, find a definition that you prefer, and then apply it globally throughout Scripture. That is not a valid way of word study, and as much as and so much plays, so much more plays a factor in the situation. If you stop to really think about it, words themselves really have no meaning. For instance, think of the word run. What does it mean? If I asked you for a definitive meaning of the word, what would you say? Hopefully, giving it a moment of thought, you would agree that it doesn't really mean anything because it could mean practically anything. Even if you looked it up in a dictionary, you would be presented with multiple options. First off, is this word a noun or a verb? You don't know. If it was a noun, it could be referring to a way of keeping score in a baseball game. There are three runs in this inning. It could be after when you paint and the drips you find. The paint has run. It could be a continued series, like a magazine or book, like this is the, th the second run of this particular novel or this, of that series. But what if it was a verb? Then it could be something faster than a walk. It could be someone trying to win a political office. I think I'll run for governor this year. Or it could be a machine that is turned on and functioning. Would you go in there and turn the dishwasher and make sure it's running? Run the dishwasher, please. It could be a liquid that is spilled and spread out. You spilled my water. It's run all over the table. So in a good dictionary, this word alone could mean 70 different things. So the word in and of itself means nothing. Meaning is determined by context and usage. Usage is determined by the author, their cultural understanding, and the general worldview concepts that they employ. We know that grammar has rules, but some tend to forget that ancient languages likewise have rules of grammar that would assist in understanding words and terms. Then we must also account for how that word was used culturally and historically at the time the book was written. It must also be determined if the words being read are not being used literally by the author. What is the context of the words in the verse? And are they possibly part of a cultural idiom, for instance? We may have a letter where we would say to so-and-so, kick the bucket. We've heard this before. But what would someone a thousand years from now make of that statement? A dictionary would tell us all the possible meanings of kicked as well as bucket. But would that help someone understand what is being said here in any way? Well, was there a literal bucket being kicked? No, it is part of a cultural context of the writer. It is an idiom. And likewise, the Bible contains idioms we won't understand if we do not understand their cultural use. So when looking at context, we start simple. Hopefully everyone knows that we cannot take part of a verse out of its context and build a belief on it. An extreme example would be for someone to say that, yes, the Bible actually does indeed state that God does not really exist. For we know right in Psalm 14, we are told there is no God. Psalm 14.1. Of course, we should all know that Psalm 14.1 actually says, the fool has says in his heart, there is no God. Now, this example, of course, is a very extreme one, would rarely come up. Hopefully, nobody would be crazy enough to do that. But we understand that taking words out of their context like this, can, you can make things say anything. And it was not help you to understand what the text is saying. So moving on now to a full verse contextual abuse, I will state that this has been a topic that I have for about the past 30 years written against occasionally because it's such a rampant practice in Christianity and it drives me crazy. Back in the 1990s, I used to print a self-published magazine which contained a column called Out of Context. And now I have a similar column on my blog dealing with this. When it comes to full text, full verse textual abuse, one of the most recent ones that I wrote about was Jeremiah 29 11, which is a favorite one of many Christians today. You'll find it on mugs, calendars, embroideries, posters, you name it. I'm sure you're likewise familiar with it. It states, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not, the, not for evil to give you a future and a hope. What an encouraging and gracious saying to comfort everyone around you with. But is that what this verse is really being written to tell us? Let's stop to examine this one for a minute. When we read scripture, which consists of words written down, we do good to follow 
the five W's of grammar that most of us were probably taught in school. The who, what, when, where, and why. So, when we examine a verse like this one, we can ask, who is speaking and who was being spoken to? Well, we back up just one simple verse to find out who was speaking. For thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 29.10. And so, who was he speaking to? For that, we back up to verse 4, and we discover, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So, we have Yahweh speaking to those who were sent into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon, and we move on to the next W, which is to ask, what is he speaking of? We find that out again by looking at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So, we have Yahweh speaking. He is speaking to those in exile in Babylon. And he tells them that he will visit them to fulfill his promise to bring them back into their land. So, when was this written? It was written around the 6th century B.C. when Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were taken captive in Babylon, as we saw in verse 4. And when were these promises to take place? When the 70 years were completed, as we also see there in verse 10, when the 70 years were completed. Where was this written? Well, we see in verse 3 how it was written and sent to the people held in Babylon. The letter was sent by the hand of Lassa, Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Who spoke? Yahweh spoke. Spoke to who? The exiles from Jerusalem. When did he speak? When they were in exile. Where did he speak? The area of Babylon. What was he speaking of? His promise to visit his people in exile. So finally, what did, why did he say this, the why? We have partially seen the answer. It was to state that Yahweh was going to keep his promise to those exiled people. But why was he going to fulfill this promise? This is what our verse in question tells us. For thus says the Lord, who? When 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which... I sent you into exile. So hopefully you see that in its proper context, this verse is not a general promise of comfort to be pronounced upon all Christians today, for it was a promise from Yahweh given for a specific people in history in a specific scenario, specific time in history past. It was to them that he had these special plans, and this becomes so clearly evident by simply reading the surrounding verses. Now, like I mentioned before, this is a point of context application where most would stop when it comes to the idea of context. They want to keep it in its paragraphs. I would like to now consider two more avenues of context that we will look at that assist us in better understanding the biblical text. So we will go back to the initial quote that we had originally started with to find some of these additional contents mentioned. Just as with every text there is a context, so with every context there is a worldview. Actually, in any context, there are several worldviews, the prophets, the hearers, and the one progressively unveiled through Revelation to which the first two must conform. One of the contexts most people miss is that of the worldview pro producing the text. Readers today want to impose their modern worldview on the text, and that causes many issues with interpretation. So what do we mean by worldview of the writer? We have already hinted at it a moment ago, and you may have heard Dave mention it in the past. He has spoken occasionally of it. This means we need to understand, for instance, how words, phrases, idioms, and theological beliefs were understood and used during the time period in which the text in question was written. During the time of the writing of a text, how were spiritual concepts understood? 
And how was the surrounding culture influential on the text being examined? What were the issues of the day that were influential on why the writer wrote what they did? Now, of course, for those who were at the conference, and if you weren't, you can find this online, but we can find one extreme case of this on Dave's lecture on the hair and sexuality. So that's how culture influenced, the, the worldview influenced that. So you can go find that on YouTube if you need to. Just look up hair and sexuality. Okay, and a quick overview of that would be con <laughs> head coverings in the Corinthians and However, sadly, the Bible, which is grammar, as I said earlier, is nevertheless rarely given the same treatment as we give other grammar of our times as far as the context. When we read a book written, say, 200 years ago, we know we're going to run into words, phrases, and terms that we do not always use or understand in today's culture. We therefore stop and examine those words and what they meant to the writer at their time. This is often what is missed, though, when we examine the Scripture. Instead, Scripture is viewed as a book that was written and given supernaturally, having had zero influence within it by the worldview or culture of the writer who gave it. This is a faulty view that leads to all kinds of interpretational issues. What is missed or often misunderstood is that biblical writers were people too. While that seems to be an obvious statement, many miss the implications that such a statement has on our topic. Instead of them being people, many have this understanding of biblical inspiration that would make the writer more like robots than men. It is probably safe to say that the majority of evangelicals would view the idea of inspiration as if it were a series of paranormal events. The prophet or writer gets up in the morning, he's brushing his teeth, and pow, zap, pow, Yahweh hits him with the vision, puts him into a trance, and feeds their hand the scientifically and spiritually perfect words of truth directly from on high. It is viewed as if Yahweh takes over man's functions and writes the words himself, without influence from the writer at all. Then the writer awakes from the trance and looks down and sees these words from on high and marvels at the truth that has come through him, which has zero influence by him. That idea is a myth and not the way of insp that inspiration works. The writers of biblical text were people, and they wrote during a specific time in history they had a specific set of beliefs and understandings connected to their time and culture, and those understandings were, in fact, influential in their writings. Did some of the writers write things they did not understand? Well, of course they did, but that is not what I mean here. Those tend to be prophetic times when the Spirit moved, and the writer, moved the writer to say something they did not quite understand how it was going to play out. A more proper way to look at the idea is to think of, instead of Yahweh's use of a certain writer, while it may be thought that he randomly chose this person here and then put them in a trance and wrote this book, and then he randomly chose that person and put them in a trance and wrote that book, there's a better way we could look at it. Instead of being this series of paranormal experiences at a later date in their life, think bigger picture, maybe longer time process. Instead, think of how Yahweh picked this person to be the writer because of their existing understanding, theology, and general worldview. Think instead that Yahweh would have been instrumental throughout all of their life, leading them into places, thoughts, and understandings to shape and form them into the person that they are, and then had them write this particular book, which will be presented from their worldview. Then that real person does not need some paranormal experience to cause them to produce the text, when instead they are real people and could be prompted and led by the Spirit from God to write using their own language and manner that gets the truth across. When you stop to think about it, this idea is not something we don't already believe. Most people know that the writings of one apostle differ from the writings of another because of their writing style differences. It is obvious that there is a human influence in the writings and not just some robotically produced text of truth direct from on high. So Yahweh takes real people and uses them in a real time to produce a text with real human influence to get across the truth that he has them to produce. So, that being the case, we therefore must understand that the writing produced has a context, an influence from the writer's worldview and the worldview of those being addressed. The biblical text produced is therefore only fully understood if the writer's worldview is understood. We must not try to force our worldview and context upon it, as so many often do, or we stray into territory quite alien to the initial audience. In times past, the practice of imposing a modern worldview upon the Bible has been common, and through it has brought forth church creeds, confessions, theological systems of belief, etc. Now, this is not to say that all creeds and confessions are hopelessly flawed. 
It is simply to say that those things are usually a product of the worldview and culture of the time in which they were produced, and not the context of the biblical writings. We must understand that the biblical context is not my context. It is not your context. It is not the context of your pastor. It's not the context of your church leadership. It's not the context of your denomination. It's not the context of the popular modern-day evangelists and preachers. Insert your favorite preacher name here or author. It is likewise not the context of the great thinkers in the past. It is not the context of C.I. Schofield or Charles Ryrie or John Walvoord or Dwight Moody or Charles Spurgeon or John Wesley or John Calvin or Martin Luther. It is not the context of Aquinas, Augustine, or Tertullian. Biblical theology is not oriented towards any of the worldviews that any of these people had. Biblical context is not their context. The context of the early church fathers, the medieval writers, the reformers, the modern teachers, etc., is a context that is alien to the biblical context of the original writers. So if we seek to truly keep things in context, we must understand that the context we must take serious is that of the original biblical writers. Their context is the one that we should take seriously when it comes to guiding our thoughts on interpreting the scriptures properly. Therefore, we must seek to know and understand what that context was. That context goes farther and much wider than simply looking at keeping the words and paragraphs in their context. Though honestly, if we just take that step alone, the church today would be in a much better state. Instead of doing the work of finding the writer's context, most biblical readers will filter the scripture through whatever their preferred filter tends to be. They believe this or that because their pastor or their favorite author or their chosen creed or their church denomination teach it. And obviously this has caused major problems. This is one of the central issues that has caused so, so many different odd interpretations of the text that often leads to debates, church splits, and new denominations altogether. It is the context and worldview of the writers that has been mentioned to you time and time again in the past couple years. When David speaks about things like the Ugaritic texts and the ancient Near Eastern material, it is writings like those that can assist us in understanding the context of the writers of the Tanakh. And when you hear us speak of things like Second Temple material, like the Pseudepigrapha, the Deuterocanical writings, the Apocryphal works, as well as maybe the Dead Sea Scroll writings and other works like that and the historians of that day, those are the tools that can assist us in building the context of the New Testament worldview. Of course, this means more work than the average Christian is willing to spend in Bible study. Instead, they'd rather pick up the Bible and just read it and then misapply it to their own life, their own context, and their own worldview and twist it to mean a number of things beyond what it was ever written to mean. Aside from misunderstanding portions of the text, there is often much that is missed within the text itself. The original writer might be making a very profound point, but it is really only profound to those original hearers who knew what localized or contemporary event were being referenced, or to those who have studied the context as we are speaking of. One example, which has given, been given from this pulpit many times in the past, is the scenario of the cloud rider. I think David mentioned this a couple weeks ago. In the Ugaritic and Old Testament Hebrew, Baal's epithet as a storm god was he who rides on the clouds. In Phoenician, he was called Baal Shaman, Lord of the Heavens. So when the Hebrews come along and take that title and apply it to Yahweh, they are in essence mocking or belittling Baal. They call Yahweh the cloud rider as we see in Isaiah 19 an oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. And the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Isaiah 19.1. But that emphasis is totally missed by someone unaware of the context wherein it was written because the full story of Baal and his view is not contained within the Tanakh. So if someone is clueless on the Baal story, then the biblical story is just read at face value and they totally miss the deeper profound meaning that the statement has that the writer was trying to get across here. Another type of example would be in missing the point because of misunderstanding the use of language. This is something that has been touched upon at times before also. Things like idioms of the time that may go right over our head today. Another example would be when people get introduced to the idea of the divine council, which has been talked about here recently. The multiple number of the Elohim that exists. Many would be quick to deny such a teaching. And they would quote 
See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God, Elohim, beside me. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Seems pretty clear cut. It's obviously seeming to teach that there is only one singular God, one Elohim. So the divine council idea of is obviously a myth, myth because it's got to be thrown out because it teaches that there are more than one Elohim. So just reading these words and defining them could lead one to such a conclusion. But that only holds true if there is this ignorance of context. Understanding the historical context and use of words would lead someone to see that the phrase, I am and there is none beside me, was an ancient biblical slogan of incomparability or sovereignty and not a statement meaning exclusivity of existence. In the, their worldview context, it was their way of stating that a certain authority was the absolutely most powerful when compared to any other authority. It did not mean that there was not any other authority at all, but that of all of them, this one was the highest. So when properly understood, this phrase is actually a statement in favor of a divine council view. <clears throat> the same phraseology is used elsewhere in Scripture in Isaiah 47.8 and Zephaniah 2.15, referring to Babylon and Nineveh respectively, and yet I doubt anyone would claim them to be used as a means of exclusivity. So it only gets brought up when it is suitable for your current argument. So in closing this point, there are many examples in Scripture where these types of role reversals or e idiomatic statements are made, and unless the reader knows the worldview context of the writing, they will most likely miss the emphasis being made or totally twist the original meaning. In scholarly circles, it is called comparative studies when someone is using other writings of the same era of time in order to help establish a context for whatever the writing is that is in question. It is used often in the real world, but most evangelicals ignore the practice when they consider it as far as scripture goes. In our world of biblical studies, to apply comparative studies would be to use the ancient Near Eastern writings of the same era of that time that the Tanakh was written in order to better understand the history, culture, and terminology that we find within the Tanakh. Most Christians would shy away from such an idea because, again, they feel that the scriptures were a series of paranormal experiences that the words have come down directly from God in an unadulterated manner. Therefore, there is nothing that can be gained from reading or understanding human involvement in the writing process. This has been a long-time evangelical attitude, but unfortunately, but fortunately, has been losing ground in the last few decades, in the scholarly world at least. Of course, it may be centuries now before those scholarly ideas get leaked into the, from out of the scholarly world into the real world, and even longer before Christians study and read on the subject. In the end, for the average person to get the full thrust of what Scripture is saying, it will require some work in order to start thinking like an ancient writer. Fortunately, a lot of the work has been accomplished by the scholars and is just requiring, it requires us to get into it and become familiar with their ancient worldview. While I could go on further in that direction, my main point is Scripture must be read and understood within its own context and taken into consideration the worldview of the writer. Until this is done, the church will continue to decipher things incorrectly. Now, moving on, I would like to discuss other ways we can understand context. It is important when reading a portion of the scripture that we understand what type of literature we are reading and understand the grammatical laws that apply to that type of literature. The Bible, as we know, is made up of different genres of writing, and we must approach each properly when interpreting them. This is something we do daily without even giving it much thought, yet most people fail to do it when it comes to the Scripture. For instance, if during the day you read a personal letter, a legal brief, a comic book, a blog post, a bill or invoice, or a post on Facebook, you approach each differently because you know they contain different styles of content. You take them in their proper context usually. The same thing can be said about reading a book. If you read a fiction novel, you won't approach an understanding of it in the same way as you would a non-fictional biography or history book. Well, we find such divisions within Scripture, but people do not always adjust their thoughts appropriately. Within the Bible, we find various literary types that are not always approached properly, and so understandings can easily be taken out of context. One of the more common literary types found in Scripture is that of the narrative, storytelling. The bigger portion of Scripture would fit into the narrative type. We have almost everything from Genesis to Second Chronicles, and the better part of the prophets, 
the Gospels, and Acts, all being mostly of the narrative genre. So the best approach to reading these portions is to approach them like you would a fiction novel. Now obviously this is not to say that you would approach them to thinking they are fiction, but simply read them with the same mindedness as you would a fiction novel. If you read a narrative like it is a novel, your mind will be tuned in such a way as to aid you in observing things that the text is and observing things within the text in an intelligent manner. For instance, when reading a novel, there is usually this intuitive sense that the writer of a story is trying to do something to you. At times, they may be, may be trying to misdirect you, or they may be planting some scene, word, or character into your mind that you know will bear some importance later on. We tend to pick up on these things and know to expect it to show up or play significance at some later point in the story. A lot of times, and to some extent, we may store these things away subconsciously. But chances are you are doing it because you know when reading fiction, things are there because the writer has placed them, these things in the story for some purpose that you have yet to discover. Similarly, if you watch much TV, you probably practice the same type of paying attention to detail when things are brought up that seem somewhat insignificant. In TV episodes, you are aware that the director has a limited amount of time. And so, therefore, anything that is put in front of you taking up that time must have some significance. So as you read or watch such narrative-styled things, you may start thinking and asking questions to yourself about how this or that fits in with the storyline. You engage your mind and pay closer attention to the story, watching for how themes and pieces come around to fitting together. Well, that is the approach that's needed when you read narrative biblical portions. Read them as if you would fictional narratives. Instead, most people approach the Bible as a textbook, and it not only kills our typical inquisitiveness, but we lose the content in which they were purposely writing. Read the biblical narratives realizing that just like fictional material, the writer had an agenda and a plan for what he has written and how it was worded, because he did. As you read, just like with fiction, watch for things that could be cases of symbolism. Look for repeating words or ideas that jump out as important. Look for words and phrases that could be written to be purposefully interpreted in more than one way. Watch for figurative language and pay attention to the roles that the characters play within the story. Again, these types of things you're most likely already doing with fiction, but failing to do with scripture. Try to change gears when reading narrative portions of scripture and approach things with the fictional reading frame of mind. Now moving on, I wish to briefly look at another quick couple of circumstances in Scripture that kind of lose their power due to the ignorance of the worldview and context of the writers. Let's touch upon the ancient view of ghosts as we look at the familiar story from the Gospels about the walking on the water of Yeshua as we read in the beginning. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, and when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. And we read through that, just kind of blow over things, but you know, some of the things you might want to point out is like, evening came, and it's a fourth watch. You know, what do all these pieces mean? Now, there is a significance here that is not always picked up on, and that is relating to them thinking it was a ghost approaching them. In the ancient world of which the apostles wrote, there were indeed stories of ghosts and apparitions, and there were indeed stories of walking on the water. But one thing that there was not is the idea that a ghost could walk on the water. One author, Jason Combs, discusses this background history and the implications of it on the gospel story in an article that he wrote entitled, A Ghost on the Water? Understanding an Absurdity in Mark 6, 49-50. He shows how it was an absurd notion for the apostles to think it was a ghost on the water because, again, it was common knowledge in their worldview that ghosts cannot walk on water. He states, Mark, then, has set the scene for a classic tale of a haunting specter through his use of the word ghost, the nighttime hours, the point you pointed out a second ago, the faint light of an approaching dawn, the fourth hour, the disciples' fearful response. Yet Mark diverges drastically from one key component of ancient ghost stories that involved water. Ghosts cannot walk on water. Several Greek and Latin sources demonstrate 
this ghostly inability. The article goes on to make the case for the understanding of such ghost stories at that time and points out one significant fact from ancient history that plays an often overlooked part in the story here. Referring to one major study of the issue, Combs states, Adele Yarbrough Collins has written a thorough treatment of the Greco-Roman text that parallels Jesus' walking on the sea and has quite convincingly demonstrated the wealth of evidence for gods, God-gifted rulers, and divine men walking on the sea. What they conclude is that we have this story in the Gospels, and it includes all of the elements of a typical storyline of a ghost story of their day, but with one twist. This perceived ghost is walking on water, something that ghosts cannot do, but that a divine man could do. Here is the problem. In the ancient world in which this was written, Collins states that it would have been fairly common, a fairly common understanding that walking on the water was something for divinity, not ghosts. Yet here is Christ walking on the water, and instead of understanding the historical significance that is being tied here to his divinity, the apostles believe something absurd, that it was instead a ghost, doing something that they cannot do. Combs puts it this way, Yarbrough Collins, Collins, as noted previously, reviews a wealth of Greco-Roman sources that describe divine men and gods walking on water. With so many prominent account, accounts, Mark's audience would certainly have understood Jesus' water walk in terms of divine manifestation, yet the disciples in Mark do not. So why would they miss the obvious and believe such an absurdity? If you recall from the opening reading, Mark tells us just two verses later that it was because their hearts were hardened. When we read the same story in Matthew, we do get a glimpse of the idea that maybe after the fact it might have become a little more evident that they understood the idea of divinity being portrayed here. For we are told in that story, and when they got into the boat, when they, because Peter was there, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So in this version of the story, it wasn't, you know, their heart didn't mention the heart's heart, they, they believed that he was the Son of God. In the end, unlike the original first century audience who read Mark, Modern readers will most likely have missed the nuances and emphasis of this divine manifestation that is portrayed here in Mark's ghost story if they are unaware of the pieces of historical context that this story is drawing from and built upon. Now, continuing on in the topic with the topic of ghosts, let us turn to what some others have pointed out regarding the historical con uh, worldview and its application of Scripture when it comes to post-mortem apparitions, so after death appearances. In Luke 24, we are told the story of the empty tomb and the appearances of Christ to his disciples. We are told how he appears suddenly, disappears suddenly, he eats, he is touched, and other pieces of information about his activities after death. However, what we may not pick up on is the ancient worldview that Luke is borrowing from and twisting on its head here. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, just like ghost stories, writings also existed with stories of post-mortem activities. And for the most part, they consistently spoke in terms and ideas that those in post-mortem existence would fit into four main categories of existence, the rules of post-mortem life, if you will. In a 2007 article appearing in the Journal for the Study of the New Testament, Deborah Thompson Price wrote a study entitled The Ghost of Jesus Luke 24, in light of ancient narratives of post-mortem apparitions. It examined a comparison of Greco-Roman views and Luke's use of those ideas, though again with a new twist. In the conclusion, it is summed up by saying, I submit that the method of work in Luke 24 is an attempt to disorient the reader in order to reconfigure the traditions known to the author and reader in light of the disciples' extraordinary experiences of the resurrected Jesus. After all, Luke can only describe Jesus' post-resurrection appearances with the vocabulary and literary models he has at his disposal. Now, stopping right there, note that the point being made has what we've been talking about all, all this morning. Luke is writing within the context and understanding of the worldview of his time. In other words, he's not making up new terms to describe what is happening. He's using local historical terminology that his audience at the time would have fully grasped. Again, in order to fully grasp what he is saying, we must understand the context of which he is working from within. 
So if we acknowledge that Luke is describing things using only the vocabulary and literary models that are available at the time, then the quote goes on to say, but what if those deemed inadequate for this purpose, the terms that he's using? And, not, and no one type of apparition is thought efficient, sufficient to represent what the, the disciples had experienced. In this case, Luke would be left with insufficient language and models. So if Luke was using only the context of the worldview wherein he was writing, yet the individual terms are inadequate for truly representing what was happening, what can be done? Well, how about we just merge all the pieces together? Or to, to, in fact, create a similar yet contrary viewpoint that shows greater significance of the Christian view over the Greco-Roman one. As Price goes on to state, if, however, all possible models, models are incorporated, thereby displaying the breadth and magnitude of Jesus' resurrected presence, while at the same time the limitations of each model are highlighted, then the author is able to work within the parameters of the literary and cultural expectations of the audience to express a phenomenon that surpasses those expectations. So, evidence seems to reveal that Luke took familiar ideas of his immediate context, yet combined the different concepts to produce a unique view to describe what he saw in the resurrected Christ. Or, as, Christ, as Price puts it in the closing of the article, in Luke 24, the author invites his readers to reimagine and resist, to an extent, the perspectives of their Hellenistic community in light of their Christian community's unique experience of and convictions about the resurrected Jesus. So, let's quickly look at the concept that Luke is working with and how he made them his own. In looking at the common worldview understanding at his time, the Greco-Roman concepts fell, like I said, into four main categorical views about post-mortem existence. They, those views were the disembodied spirits. This, these are like basically what we would call ghosts. They appear as they did in life. They look like themselves. They cannot be touched, and, and they are able to disappear. Then there's the revenants, which are reanimated corpses, not zombies. Um, they appear as they did in life, fully touchable, but their revival is a short term. Then there's heroes. Now, heroes were, their graves were known and revered. Physical contact is possible, and they may change appearance. Then there's translated mortals. Those are people who most likely haven't died. They've just translated into becoming a spirit life. Uh, so most often without death or death is disputed. They appear as they did in life. They're touchable and or their body is cast off and the soul alone transcends. <clears throat> So if the discussion was about someone coming back after the death, after death, in that time, the worldview would understand that they had to fit into one of these four concepts of existence. Yet, from what we are told about the resurrected Christ, he didn't fit squarely into any of these categories, but borrows from all and goes beyond the limitations of all. Let's break them down and see what we have. We have disembodied spirits. They appear as they did in life. Okay, Christ appeared as they did in life. They cannot be touched. Well, we know he could, so he doesn't, that, he fails that point. He's able to disappear. We've seen he does that. Uh, now that, so he's two out of three of that one. He could be one of those, but not all the way. Revenants, reanimated corpse, yes, we see that. He had a body. He appeared as he did in life. He's fully touchable, but he, his revival was not short term. Heroes, graves with the body within are known and revered, so we know there's an empty grave. Physical contact is possible, yes, he meets that qualification. When appearing, he may change appearance. We've seen that people didn't know what he always looked like. Translated mortals, well, most often without death, well, he doesn't fit that category. They appear as they did in life, he fits that. And he's touchable or the body is cast off, so we know he's touchable. So as you can see, in all the views that they have, he's, he doesn't fulfill any of them altogether. <clears throat> so in the end, what we do find that Luke reveals about Christ is this. In Luke 13, 23, 46, 55, Yeshua is dead, his tomb is known. That's inconsistent with disappearances and translational traditions. It is consistent with disembodied spirits, heroes, and revenants. Luke 24, where the tomb is empty. It's inconsistent with most translation stories, heroes, and disembodied spirits, but is consistent with revenant tradition. 
Yeshua is dead, his tomb is known. Inconsistent with disappearances and translation traditions. Consistent with disembodied spirits, heroes, and revenants. Luke 24, 3, 6, 12, 23 to 24, the tomb is empty. It's inconsistent with most translation stories, heroes, and disembodied spirits, but consistent with revenant tradition. Yeshua offers a visual inspection of his hands and feet to establish identity. This is consistent with expectations of all apparitions and appearances unchanged in death. Yeshua offers a touchable inspection of his flesh and bone. This is inconsistent with disembodied phantoms, but consistent with revenants and heroes. Yeshua eats in the disciples' presence. This is no, there's no absolute inconsistency with any tradition here, and it's clearly consistent only with revenant traditions. Yeshua is bodily taken up to heaven. This is inconsistent with traditions of a disembodied souls, heroes, and revenants, but consistent with translation or apotheosis tradition, deification. So as you can see, during the time the gospel story was written, the writers were taking common worldview themes and using them to tell the story. Though, as we have often done in, as is often done in scripture, they were borrowing from the common ideas and twisting or expounding them into a new idea for showing the superiority of Christianity. And this is not much different than what we have seen taking place in the Tanakh when they took the common worldview context of the surrounding nations and twisted them to show Yahweh's power, like we mentioned in the Baal story that uh, earlier. Of course, if you don't know the context, there's a lot of that in the Old Testament that we really don't see. It happens a lot more than just that one story. So the whole point of this message today is to show how a lot of story play is missed, as well as an emphasis behind why it may be said the way it was said, simply because people today take things out of their historic context and read their own modern worldview into the scripture and not understand the worldview of the writer. Doing this causes much confusion, multiple odd interpretations, all of which leads to disputes and divisions in the church. And with each generation that gets further from the original, the worldviews change and the interpretations become more diluted and odd. I have only looked at a few of the possible literary contexts this morning. We could have looked into how to approach other genres like the parable, the proverb, comedy, prophecy, apocalyptic, military, or the historical annals, genres, for instance, that appear in the Bible. Hopefully we have covered enough to give you a peek at the depth of study that can and should be done when approaching Scripture. Sadly, most seem ignorant of this whole idea or of approach, which is why I thought it was worthy of discussing it today. People have to understand that what we have in Scripture is not some purely supernatural set of heavenly text that was handed down from heaven in a force field protected bubble through paranormal activities by Yahweh, which has zero human influence. Once it is understood for what it is and what it contains and how the writer's worldview would have played a part and what the worldview was, it is then that we can begin truly digging into the depths of Scripture and its intended purpose. Then we be can begin looking not at what the scripture can be made to mean to us, but what did they actually mean to them and their audience at that time. And once that is understood, we can better grasp how it applies to us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for just the depth that is there that we can work to understand and the new things that we can learn every time we read through it. We pray, Lord, that we would be diligent to study your word, to not just read it, but to stop and, and think and to look deeper into the things, what we could be missing, what could be being said there that we are totally oblivious to. Help us, Lord, to honor you in all that we do and help us to just continue to study and to continue to just love your word more and more. Thank you so much for these things. Amen.